Dear friends, um, welcome uh, to our home. It is a great pleasure to have you here. Um, I, uh, I'm really happy to have so uh, important people in our, in our home and uh, of course to um, have the, our first uh, Hermes Forum. For those of you who don't know, our master mess started five years ago, actually on the 17th of March of uh, 2013 in Montreal, uh, next to an IKEA event. And uh, from that time, uh, we grew up and we arrived to be 120 uh, members from uh, all parts of the air transport industry. Uh, one, what changed over the, for these five years is that uh, we started as a club, and uh, with the board that. Um, Thanks to them, uh, we can make really, I can make really great things. We have Robert de Jong, the Vice President of Fermes, but also we have uh, uh, Vijay Kunusam, who is the President. We have Henry Kololé. Now, unfortunately, will not be able to be here uh, today. Philip will, will, I think, will say a few, few words about that. And uh, also we'll have uh, in the board Angela Gittens and uh, Jeff Poole. That means we cover uh, all part of the uh, air transport chain. We decided to change uh, from a club and to become a not-for-profit organization based in Montreal. We finalized the procedure and, uh, over this direction and soon um, we will be able to have uh, some good news to share with you. One of the main reasons of existence of Fermes is to contribute uh, uh, to the evolution of the air transport. That's why we have this forum today. It's not to organize another event. We have too many events uh, around the globe. Uh, but what we want is to contribute. Uh, Hermes is the human capital of the air transport. They are people. The, the, the members, we have many members here, uh, they participate in themselves. They don't represent their organization. That's very um, <coughs> critical. Therefore, we decided with Henrik, and we spent six months to organize, and I would like to thank all of the speakers and all the participants that uh, um, <coughs> we found the slot to come here uh, today to start something, uh, what I call a new era for aviation, in order to be able to contribute uh, over the future and to make recommendation in order to improve this air transport industry. In 2014, we celebrated 100 years of commercial aviation, and Hermes uh, hosted and, well, co-hosted with ICAO an event in, in, uh, in Montreal about 100 years of commercial aviation, and we make a presentation of a book that was um, and it was uh, made by Hermes in cooperation <coughs> with, um, with ICAO, ACI, ICAMS, and IADA. Um, of course, I need to thank the sponsors uh, of this event, that is uh, Athens International Airport, Gold Air Handling, and of course, Akali Club. And um, coming into the topic, um, as I said, we are going to speak about the ownership of control. Uh, Philippe uh, uh, will uh, deliver the keynote uh, address about this uh, topic, but what is uh, the next steps? Uh, today we have the, um, this forum, and uh, I will ask all of you that are here to interact. It's not just to have just the speakers, but I want to have interaction. That's why we are not in a big conference room. We could go anywhere in Athens, but we said I want to be more close environment, to have a nice interaction, a private interaction, we want to say, you know that something will come on. <coughs> then uh, we have two uh, moderators, uh, Professor Papa Theodoro and uh, John Hanlon in the park, but uh, together with me and Robert de Jong, and probably if, if Henrik uh, will be able uh, to join by phone, we will prepare the conclusion of this forum uh, uh, this afternoon. After that, I will ask uh, some of you that you represent organization to um, um, prepare a position paper about this topic. And also, um, in Hermes, we plan to have, uh, an, uh, starting this month, a magazine. And we'll um, we'd like to have articles from a member of Hermes, um, again, regarding this topic. Once we finish this second leg, what we're going to do is to have a, a team of experts, we call, that um, uh, will give to them the conclusion of this forum, of today forum, and also the position papers and the articles, and they're going to prepare uh, the final recommendation for the air transport industry that will going to be distributed to all um, parties. That's what is the first step we want to do as Hermes. And on an, an annual basis, here uh, in Akali, we're going to have a different topic. Then you are more than welcome to make your uh, proposal for next year. 
uh, topic in order to move forward. That's the idea of Fermes. That's what we want to do, what we want to achieve. And of course, uh, we are open uh, for your um, ideas um, uh, for, for the future, not only about the forum. You know very well that we have a close collaboration with all the key organizations. We have in ICAO and in, in the annual assembly a, a cocktail reception uh, where uh, Bernard Aliou, the president of ICAO, became uh, an honorary member. Uh, we have, um, uh, over the last three years with IATA, um, a, a reception um, in uh, the IATA AGM. And from last year, we have also in the ACI. That means, in principle, in, in the major events around the industry, we have a, a present uh, as well. Nice. I don't want to talk uh, longer. I would like to invite Philippe that um, uh, will deliver um, uh, his keynote uh, address. And once again, welcome here. Uh, dear Costas, uh, first of all, thank you very, very much for uh, hosting us here in your very elegant home, I must say, that I have seen on, on photographs, but not for myself uh, yet. And uh, it, it is a great pleasure for me personally, uh, quite unexpectedly, to be able to be uh, uh, among you today. Um, I can say that uh, Henrik, uh, of course, was very keen to be here. This is one of his favorite gatherings. Uh, favorite places, uh, and I'm going to speak about one of his favorite topics. Um, and uh, he had a, a, a medical issue, he's better now, I saw him yesterday, but uh, clearly he has to take it uh, easy, and uh, the one person he's listening to is, uh, is his doctor, uh, and uh, his doctor managed even to convince him not to come to uh, uh, today's uh, event. But what is very special for me is uh, not only that I can be with you today, but also it's the first time that Henrik has actually written a speech for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I will try to deliver it with the same passion that you would expect from him, on, on particularly on this kind of topic, and congratulations for choosing a, a topic that uh, indeed will uh, lead to, uh, that generally leads to a lot of emotion, and, and hopefully uh, today uh, to some emotion and then some conclusions. Now, before getting to the, the heart of the topic, um, let's take stock of where we are. It's a very good period for aviation. Uh, 2017 was a record year. As you know, 4 billion passengers uh, were carried on scheduled services last year. Uh, we saw more than 7% growth uh, in, uh, in carriage. Uh, and air transport carriers, uh, about over half of the world's international tourists, and 35% of world trade by value according to uh, ICAO figures. So what we are talking about, the sector we are working in, really uh, does matter. And prospects are also very good for the future. Uh, IATA expects uh, in, uh, in, in about 20 years to have practically a double <coughs> of the number of passengers. At the same time, the airline industry remains a highly cost-intensive uh, industry dependent on other industries and stakeholders in the aviation ecosystem. Uh, and generating, generally, rather limited profit margins compared to other industries. Airlines' access to capital is therefore key to survival. In Europe, we had some recent examples of bankruptcies, market exits, difficulties, uh, when it turned out that uh, access to financing became uh, limited or was stopped. We had last year uh, several cases. We had Air Berlin, we had Monarch in the UK, uh, and we have, of course, the situation with Alitalia that is still uh, being uh, finalized. Today, airlines' access to uh, financing is limited, uh, among other things, by restrictions on ownership and control, uh, whether they are included in uh, rules on airline licensing or in bilateral air services agreements worldwide. Those rules uh, are generally applied uh, throughout the world. Um, those restrictions, when we think of it, only exist in aviation, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, we should look around us uh, to other economic sectors, um, and there we see that uh, these uh, restrictions do not generally exist, they affect only airlines, and even the other stakeholders in the aviation system are not subject to uh, similar restrictions. Now, in Europe, uh, we have uh, taken quite drastic steps uh, 25 years ago when we created the internal market. Um, we uh, got rid of all the ownership and control restrictions and we have today uh, a continent that is uh, the most liberal uh, in the world. 
the European rules allow any person uh, of uh, Europe or company, a European company, to own any European carrier anywhere in Europe. Uh, and this has supported cross-border consolidation and has contributed to creation of strong pan-European airline groups. We also saw a huge increase in connectivity uh, in the last 25 years, uh, thanks uh, in no uh, mean part to the liberalization uh, of ownership and control. We also welcome in Europe foreign investment, but it is still limited to 49% unless we have agreed with a third country on a reciprocal basis to uh, liberalize uh, the ownership restrictions. We have liberalized uh, those rules with the EFTA states, with Switzerland, Norway, uh, and certain other uh, neighboring countries. But we seek to do more from Europe. Uh, we believe our uh, model has served us well, uh, and we, generally speaking, offer also liberalization of ownership and control to other countries with whom we negotiate uh, comprehensive aviation agreements. We have offered it uh, to uh, the countries with whom we are negotiating right now, ASEAN, Qatar, Turkey uh, and others. This can prove challenging because our negotiating partners uh, are not always ready to sign up for such liberalization straight away and this is the case actually for those countries that uh, I mentioned. Um, and uh, probably uh, liberalization of ownership control will not be a part of the initial stage of our future relationship. Also with countries with whom we had this in the agreement, like the United States, uh, we see that in practice we have not uh, been able to uh, activate those uh, liberalization provisions. Now, uh, regarding our ownership and control rules, they don't only limit access uh, to foreign investments, but they're also very complex uh, to implement in practice. It is a, a big challenge, I can tell you, uh, for my services to assess <coughs> if and when the European carriers are majority owned and effectively controlled by EU nationals, given the complexity of uh, airlines uh, financing and capital structures. For example, uh, what should we count as equity capital among all the different types of shares uh, uh, and equity uh, participations that may exist. Uh, and even if we can and where we can, how do we determine the nationality <coughs> of the uh, final beneficiary owner? So these are very uh, challenging questions and we've tried to clarify some of them on the basis of our experience in a set of guidelines that were adopted last year, uh, hopefully bringing more clarity uh, and thereby also facilitating giving some legal certainty to uh, foreign investment. The guidelines were generally welcomed, uh, and I'll be interested to hear your views as well. Uh, welcomed by industry uh, because they do clarify uh, to the extent possible questions of nationality, uh, assessment of ownership, uh, where airlines belong to a group or where they are listed on uh, the stock exchange. We've also tried to clarify criteria uh, to establish effective control. Uh, but uh, despite those guidelines, uh, uh, the rules actually stay uh, the way they were. Other regions of the world, as I said, <clears throat> have similar rules and usually even more restrictive than ours. The United States has a 25% cap uh, on uh, foreign ownership, uh, Japan 33%, Brazil 20%. Uh, and there are a few countries uh, like Chile who have fully liberalized uh, ownership uh, and others uh, like Australia, we've done it partially. Australia does not impose uh, ownership restrictions on internal uh, flights. Uh, what we have seen is that where ownership and control restrictions uh, exist, uh, airlines have tried to work around them with alliances, joint ventures, uh, seeking antitrust immunity, but of course uh, these are probably second best solutions um, for uh, uh, cooperation or integration uh, 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 between airlines. Uh, and they are a substitute only to a real open legal framework. And in fact, the pressures that we see on those uh, 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 forms of cooperation show that there is indeed a desire for uh, closer uh, uh, consolidation. The liberalization of investment rules, whether unilaterally or among like-minded states, is only half the story. Today, our airlines are operating beyond the EU under bilateral agreements, and those requirements still require them to remain majority-owned and effectively controlled by EU nationals. 
given the international nature of air transport, uh, this situation limits the potential of liberalizing investment rules. If countries A and B liberalize investment, it is possible that country C still refuses flights uh, from actually either of those countries on the grounds that the airlines are not really nationals of the country from where they are operating. So um, this may, even if we were to liberalize uh, with certain of our foreign partners, it may still make uh, that form of consolidation not fully attractive because the uncertainty <coughs> Uh, that uh, operations to other third countries uh, might still uh, have. So, <clears throat> uh, and at worst, such investments could uh, therefore be uh, prevented due to international constraints. And we have some experience in the EU uh, where uh, we have some third countries who occasionally make difficulties uh, when uh, <coughs> European airlines are flying. They sometimes ask, well, is this really an Austrian <coughs> airline or an Italian airline, uh, etc. In practice, it works, but there, there's no legal certainty. So coming to the uh, essence of uh, today's debate, what are actually the reasons for having those barriers to investment uh, in today's world? Why do we need to keep such an obstacle to global consolidation? Why do we need to limit investment sources for airlines? Is perhaps the time come for a change? Now, airlines <clears throat> need to secure access to financing. Uh, this will help uh, to increase competition. Uh, it will provide greater connectivity at lower prices for passengers. That's what we've seen inside the EU, and we think it can be done on a larger scale. Airlines are becoming bolder in order to gain better and more efficient market access. There are new business models that uh, rapidly acquire higher market shares and need also access to financing uh, to expand their profitable businesses. <clears throat> Also, relaxing ownership and control rules may provide more options for the international strategy of established airlines by allowing cross-border global consolidation uh, of those airlines, whether within their existing alliances or, or in new uh, relationships, and thereby strengthen their position on the market. The possibility to buy airlines in other parts of the world with a clarity on the regulatory framework could be an attractive prospect as part of an airline's international growth strategy. In the long term, it could replace the need to secure fifth freedoms and beyond rights. Therefore, why should ownership be national in the most global of all industries when this is not the case in many other sectors that are equally considered strategic? Think of banking, energy, telecoms, and even airports don't have such restrictions. In Europe, we raised this issue already in the context of our aviation strategy uh, uh, that was adopted at the end of 2015. Um, and when we consulted uh, the stakeholders before uh, finalizing that strategy, the majority of stakeholders did come out in favor of further liberalization, including the relaxation uh, potentially of ownership and control rules. So we have started work internally in the context of the evaluation of our uh, internal market regulation, the so-called Regulation 1008. Uh, and the outcome of this exercise, uh, which will come hopefully uh, next year, should determine uh, if the rules on ownership and control are still fit for purpose. We will then assess several options in the context of an impact assessment. One option will be full relaxation, but we have to have several options. And, and see what is the best uh, way forward, taking into account all the constraints uh, and the pros and cons uh, of the options, and then possibly come forward with uh, new proposals uh, to change our rules. There are some creative ideas out there, and uh, they can certainly be, I hope, be part of our discussion today. Um, for example, the idea to, uh, uh, to determine the nationality uh, rather uh, not by looking at capital ownership, but at the principal place of business. Um, <clears throat> we believe we need, in any case, for regulatory reasons, a link to a particular jurisdiction for every airline, uh, even if it's only for the purposes of safety oversight. Uh, and we also need to keep in mind that uh, there needs to be a level playing field uh, for uh, uh, competition. Uh, in other words, if you operate uh, inside the EU, uh, it should be uh, the case that you follow EU rules on passenger rights, uh, on environment, social, etc., regardless of 
uh, which uh, ownership uh, you have. International uh, aviation uh, legal framework is very much based on reciprocity, and now I'm talking outside the EU. So any change uh, to EU rules will also need to take into account the wider international impact. And as I said earlier, uh, we have a web of bilateral agreements. Uh, having such a web of bilateral agreements with ownership and control liberalization, it's not enough um, because of this designation issue with third countries. So action also needs to be undertaken uh, at the international level to enable the liberalization of investment rules to be truly effective, to create legal certainty. Um, because an inherently international market like aviation cannot be looked on only at the level of individual countries or even uh, regionals like uh, Europe. So at ICAO, uh, the Air Transport Regulatory Panel is uh, currently working on a draft international convention to ease the potential uh, negative impact on an airline's international network following a change in ownership. Uh, basically, it would mean that uh, countries who sign up to that future convention uh, promise that they will not cause uh, trouble uh, with the acceptance of a designation of an airline from another country if it is owned by a, a third country, uh, if uh, and when uh, those two countries have between them liberalized ownership and control. So we from Europe uh, strongly support this work. Uh, it is uh, not an easy file and uh, a number of important states uh, are not uh, very enthusiastic. Um, uh, but we hope that it will uh, yield results. Given the sensitivity of the ownership uh, topic, we need to reassure states that this convention will still allow them to maintain their own rules uh, in their own jurisdiction, uh, rules like passenger rights, environment and so on, um, and even ownership restrictions, those who want to uh, keep them. Uh, for the airlines that they regulate or they uh, designate. And that's, for example, something at this stage the United States, it seems, would like to maintain. We need to reassure uh, those states and stakeholders that we are not opening the door to flags of convenience. <coughs> uh, in aviation, airlines should remain regulated where they are registered uh, and where they operate uh, regardless of ownership. So these are some of the contours of the, of the discussions that we are currently having uh, internally uh, and that hopefully will lead to conclusions uh, uh, partly this year and then uh, impact assessment ne next year so that we uh, could be ready when the next European Commission takes office in uh, November uh, 2019 that we could be ready if there is an interest from our future Commissioner to make uh, a new proposal uh, on our uh, internal market regulation, possibly uh, changing the rules uh, on ownership and control. So, uh, today's uh, debate is very timely to help uh, shape uh, the thinking for the future, to see where the, uh, the, the, the possibilities are, the opportunities, where the possible risks and pitfalls are. Um, and uh, I will take that back home uh, uh, with great interest uh, uh, and report to Henrik, of course, uh, and to my colleagues who are working on this file. Thank you very much again for the opportunity uh, to be here and, and to give this uh, opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Papathodoro, Andreas Papathodoro, that will moderate uh, this uh, first panel. I think uh, Philip put uh, uh, the first uh, uh, ideas into the table, and now Thank the top moderators will have the tough job to squeeze the panelists. <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kostan. May I kindly invite uh, our uh, three panelists to uh, join us here. Uh, Dr. Pavel Pelika, who is the Vice President of the European Parliament. Mr. Salvatore Sacitano, who is the Executive Secretary of the CAC, and Mr. Rob Huizer, who is the Acting Director General for Civil Aviation in the Netherlands. So, gentlemen, please join us. So, just a very uh, introductory note uh, from my part. I, I really enjoyed the uh, keynote speech, and uh, um, uh, one of the things that uh, I think what's very important is this emphasis on level playing field and <coughs> reciprocity. And uh, 
I would like to uh, briefly say a few things about a non-aviation example. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Gili. Uh, Gili is one of the uh, uh, major uh, car manufacturers in uh, China. They uh, were established in 1986 as a cheap refrigerator maker. In the early 1990s, uh, they got state approval to build cars. About uh, uh, in the early 2000s, they uh, bought Volvo. And uh, uh, a few days ago, it was uh, announced that we now uh, have in their possession 9.7% of uh, Demda. So, uh, as you may appreciate, uh, uh, this is an interesting issue. Uh, globalization is uh, everywhere, but uh, is it level playing? Huh? And uh, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, invasion from Chinese, from uh, other countries uh, into Europe. The, uh, traditional powers of this world which have been very much uh, uh, pro-trade, they have started uh, developing a, possibly an economic uh, nationalistic mentality, see for example the words of uh, Donald Trump about uh, NAFTA. So will globalization move ahead and if we are to talk about uh, level playing is uh, a double-edged sword. Huh? Are we going to see uh, more progress in terms of uh, uh, relaxing the uh, different constraints? or are we going to see uh, further constraints, possibly because uh, people or uh, organizations feel uncomfortable about uh, moving forwards. So from a strategic point of view, I think that's very, very important. And uh, what I would like to ask our panelists is uh, to set the scene, because uh, this is uh, the first panel, and uh, uh, try to uh, elaborate on this uh, very important issue, ownership and uh, uh, control in aviation. So we'll ask uh, each of our panelists to uh, briefly deliver a speech for five or ten minutes, and then I will ask a few questions, and obviously we're here to generate uh, a discussion, and uh, the uh, floor will subsequently uh, be open for questions. Thank you. So uh, may I kindly ask uh, um, Dr. Pavel Telika, who represents the uh, voice of the people in Europe, to uh, uh, start with uh, uh, his... Uh, 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 speech. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll stand up. Uh, uh, I'm a little bit provoked by the words that I represent the, the voice of people because I'm receiving on a daily basis uh, a number of nasty emails telling me who, <laughs> whom I'm representing with what I've just uh, tabled or what I've amended or modified or uh, let's see what I have reflected. Well, first of all, on, uh, I must say that uh, when I didn't see Henrik uh, uh, this morning, I thought I was going to send him a nasty text message uh, <laughs> because he, he's the one uh, that uh, basically brought me here. We had a lunch uh, a few months back. He said, uh, look, a jolly good idea, an excellent uh, group of people. You should come to Athens and so on. So I say, okay, I don't know how I'm going to manage, but uh, yes, we agreed. And then he's not here. But I understand that this is uh, for medical reasons, so uh, I'm, I'm going to text him uh, uh, after the meeting, but a uh, more pleasant uh, uh, text message than initially anticipated uh, of, of, of sending. Now, uh, I mean, uh, ownership and control, I would like to say that this is not uh, uh, an issue that uh, would be alien to the European Parliament. Uh, this is not unknown, and I must say that uh, uh, having been uh, the EP rapporteur for the European Parliament's report uh, on aviation strategy more than a year ago, uh, not only that I have included a provision uh, uh, reflecting the issue, um, but uh, of course at that time uh, I have encountered uh, uh, numerous uh, 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 debates, uh, numerous uh, concerns, uh, numerous uh, views. Uh, and I must say that uh, those of you that uh, would uh, favor uh, relaxing uh, ownership uh, and control, uh, uh, I think that would be disappointed uh, because uh, uh, the mood is, uh, the majority mood uh, would not be the one uh, that would favor that. I mean, uh, uh, the fact is, and I'm at the same time one of the reporters uh, for the revision of 868, uh, so uh, uh, the uh, legislation uh, uh, dealing with uh, competition in, uh, in uh, aviation, uh, and I must say that, uh, and you probably have also uh, monitored that, uh, that uh, there are great sensitivities and uh, the issue is to some extent by some of us, uh, I would even say, politicized. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's highly political, it's highly sensitive, uh, and uh, I, I must say that uh, hardly on uh, uh, too many other files uh, I'm getting that much, uh, uh, that much uh, pressure. But I think that uh, for the time being, uh, we have that uh, under control. So, I mean, what I want to say is that we are living in a certain environment, 
and the environment, uh, you know, regardless of whether uh, we've got uh, now uh, a fresh wind blowing in Paris with Macron and uh, re-elected, uh, I mean, some people could get the feeling that uh, maybe there is a little bit of a, of uh, a more liberal uh, attitude uh, coming back. Well, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but the reality is somewhat different. I think that uh, protectionism, and I would use that word, uh, I mean, uh, uh, which does not necessarily cover all the uh, attitude and the feelings, but it's very much there. It's not just in the European Union, it's worldwide. I think that uh, what Mr. Cornell is also referred to in terms of restrictions uh, on ownership and control, we see that uh, dominantly the situation is worse uh, uh, <coughs> elsewhere in, in the world uh, than in the European Union. So, I mean, the environment is, uh, if I would take, uh, the European Parliament, if I would take it, uh, uh, let's say, in the, uh, in the political uh, circles in Europe, is do definitely not a convenient one, whether we, we like it or not. Now, you might say, okay, but this, uh, this Parliament is coming uh, to an end of its mandate uh, in less than a, a year and a half. Uh, you know, a new Parliament will come in and a new Commission will come in. Uh, well, uh, again, I must say that, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, not just because I, I uh, belong to the Audi Group, I was uh, uh, vice chair of the Audi Group, uh, and I'm liberal in terms of my economic views, I, I, I must say that uh, uh, this is not something that I'm really uh, uh, sort of detecting. Now, ownership control, uh, uh, I think that uh, we do have a certain progress, and Mr. Cornell has referred to, uh, to the guidelines, in fact, when I was uh, preparing the, the aviation uh, report, uh, we didn't have that. And I think that uh, uh, maybe this is the first thing that we sh should do. Uh, we should uh, reflect and we should analyze you know, what uh, uh, the implementation or the very existence of the guidelines re really brought. And I, I think in both positive and negative terms, uh, I think that uh, some would be uh, more sensitive about uh, ownership, some would be more sensitive about control. But I think that it, it has already been, been referred to that even with the guidelines, uh, it's, it's still not easy. Yeah, I think that, uh, um, I'll take you maybe an example. Uh, you've got a company which is listed on the stock exchange, uh, um, and, uh, um, and I mean, there is a major intervention, a major buyout, uh, or on the contrary, you've got uh, uh, you know, uh, shareholder around 25-30%. I mean, I know that it's theoretical and maybe naive, but you, you've got then a, a very fragmented uh, portfolio. So who, who really uh, is, is controlling, especially that company, maybe apart from IEPO, has taken a, a significant uh, loans on the, on the financial market. So, uh, I mean, uh, it's not easy, I think, for the Commission services, uh, I mean, of course, for the national authorities and the, uh, the Commission services, with the change of ownership and control to really detect, you know, what is going on. They, they, this is not, not an easy uh, uh, task. And one could say, maybe uh, some could say, okay, but that's a reason more why we should, uh, apart from uh, uh, guidance uh, with the guidelines, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, in, in a sector which is in need of, of capital, especially with the innovation that will have to, have to uh, come even more, maybe that's one reason more. Well, may, maybe. I mean, I'll leave that uh, uh, as, as uh, an open question. But again, in an environment, and as uh, my colleague just uh, uh, told me, uh, reflected on the way here, said, you oh, know, uh, who's one of the most popular commissioners uh, uh, in, in Europe, and that is uh, Margaret Feschnager, the commissioner responsible for competition. And why? Well, because she's got the guts to take on uh, on Apple or other companies. And I mean, this is this is popular. This is not just popular for <coughs> stakeholders. I mean, people like it. Yeah. I mean, this this is the overall mood uh, today, uh, and as I say, not only in in Europe, but uh, to come to some kind of. Uh, uh, concluding remarks. Uh, first, you know, uh, honestly, I'm one of those that doesn't care uh, that much uh, who owns what, as long as I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm getting a, a solid uh, offer in terms of connectivity, uh, that I'm I'm uh, flying uh, on on planes uh, with uh, which have a little bit uh, more. I don't want to simplify like they deal, but a bit more legroom than the one that I had yesterday. Uh, uh, solid services. Uh, I mean, uh, really uh, digital present uh, throughout uh, my preparation for the flight, the flight and after, I mean, uh, ser services that are related to it also uh, once I uh, land, etc. I mean, this is what matters and also the, the price that I get and also the, the offer and the, the, the competition. 
And uh, if I'm a little bit uh, more up to uh, uh, the date, then of course uh, maybe I would like to see uh, planes uh, which uh, are 25% uh, less on emissions, uh, that are environmentally friendly, uh, that, have, uh, that are so socially responsible, etc. But that's me. Other people will say, well, in fact, you know, we are talking more about uh, the flag of convenience here, uh, and at the same time they are exploiting labor, uh, you know, uh, well, what about the pilots, uh, uh, and in fact this is basically, I mean, environmentally disastrous, etc. So, uh, and these are more dominant. So for me, for the future, apart from my personal, let's say, perception, I think uh, I would uh, first uh, be inclined, uh, like the Commission, but that's not uh, for the current Parliament, uh, will do, will re review and will come uh, with an impact assessment on several options. And I think that that is a positive sign. And this is what, uh, what uh, should happen. And even that will not be popular, believe me, in political circles. Uh, and I think the Parliament will be very sensitive how the impact assessment I is done and how it is assessed, I mean, uh, with, with the, all the options. But what I would like to see maybe, and that's uh, really coming to a conclusion, uh, you know, uh, again, capital, assets, uh, uh, control, uh, we could uh, name numerous examples, but I think what will matter more and more in the future is uh, not necessarily the jurisdiction uh, and the seat of the company, but where does the company pay taxes? Yeah. That's, I mean, this is, this is very, very sensitive. I mean, this is uh, across the board, across, I would say, the industry, something that matters more and more. I mean, how that company is socially responsible? What about the environmental standards? Uh, so uh, I think that uh, this might be, I wouldn't say a way out, but this might be something that will be a must in terms of assessing and maybe an opportunity uh, for relaxing and in fact reshifting and somewhat the focus what the criteria should be. But the last remark is, and let's, let's not be naive, regardless of uh, what that will bring, unless there is a change in the regulatory environment, also in the, in, in the countries uh, of airliners with which we compete, then it's going to be a technical and a legislative exercise which I think will not get the, the political platform, the political career uh, to deliver. So uh, I would say the overall involvement, uh, the regulatory environment, reciprocity, and of, of course what I want to say is that has to be, let's say, multi-based, multi it can't be a move just on the side of the union. And I say that as someone that uh, I think, and we see that in practice, that uh, both ownership and control, there are ways to go around it. Yeah. Uh, but remember, last sentence, uh, Air Berlin has been referred to Alitalia, I think others will come, and each of these cases will just give rise again to these sensitivities. So I could continue to, for talking too long, but maybe the most important issue uh, uh, sentence was just uh, a minute ago on uh, not necessarily the seat of the company, the jurisdiction, but uh, how the company performs. Uh, taxes, social, environment, uh, the overall, let's say, uh, be behavior, and the questions of the multi-framework, the regulatory environment, and reciprocity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Scacitano, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I would say that the, the, the scene has already been set by, by the intervention of all the Filippo Formelis very, very well. And it's been also very interesting you know, to listen to uh, uh, the Vice President of the European Parliament uh, expressing the mood that is in the, in, the, in the European Parliament on this subject. I do believe that our reflections could be helpful also to bring some elements that could facilitate to elaborate some initiatives that also could influence also the mood and could influence bringing some convincing arguments if something should be done. I don't want to anticipate that something should be done, but I will try to, 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 to raise some, some reflections. The first one is historical. Why? There is this kind of uh, uh, room that is not existing in other modes of transportation, first of all. There is not in the maritime system, there is not in the uh, railway system, in the road system. Mm -hmm. Well, the region, 
Well, the air transport is in ICAO. We know that more than 70 years ago, the international air transport has been regulated by international uh, air service agreements, as has been said by Philip. At that time, airlines were state airlines, were owned by member states. So there was a reason that was absolutely understandable that the control of a member state uh, on the airline should not be less than 51% in order to prevent that another member state, via its own airline, could influence the market and could influence the political situation. It was already a political issue. It was not a competition of airlines. There, were no, there was no competition at the time. It was a little bit of a competition. This was 70 years ago, 70 years ago. Air transport has been evolving during the years. There's been a deliberalization way. There has been a deprivatization way. Privatization competition, need of capital, need to find new financial resources in order to support this competition. Nowadays, we know that the ownership of the state is going down, down, down. In uh, Europe, for example, where I believe it's Air France, is the, 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 the airline that has the highest control. From, no, there, is, there are some Nordic countries, like Baltic, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, some Nordic countries. But Air France is one of the biggest, as a, as a 14% of control of the state. It's not so big. So this has brought to, Philippe has been very, very diplomatic when I say that it's difficult to identify now that now there's the control because the capital uh, are globalized. The capital, the origins of capital or the nationality of capital is not always clear. They, I've read recently an article from Qatar has been a little more aggressive against the European uh, attitude and mentioning that the situation is opaque in the sense, and partially, we, are, we must admit that there are some uh, areas where it's not very clear. For example, even in the AIG, IAG, when you have 20% of the uh, capital that is Qatar, but is by far the <coughs> largest uh, capital in, the, in, the, in this company, and the rest is uh, in the minor, or the smaller, or shareholders in the market. But that means that uh, it's difficult to, to identify. And I understand that there is a size from the European Commission is not easy. I still remember when the regulation of 1008 was, was adopted, the first implementation on the, the exercise, on the review of the actual control of a company, that when there was 49% of capital and non-EU, was very, very much in that. Now it's more difficult because of this kind of situation leads to, to, to a more difficult analysis to get to be done. That's the story. Of course, they are not mentioned, but their service agreements and the, the, the disclose of the ownership of control uh, was mandatory for the designation of uh, airlines. That was the reason why we continue to uh, face the difficulties to relax if we want to relax because whatever will be the unilateral decision, this will have implications for the designation of other third states. It's been mentioned by, by, by Philip. If two states will agree to relax the ownership and control regime, of course, the third state could not. And in this case, the designation could be lost. This is a huge problem. Anyway, let's say that, first of all, Europe has been uh, playing a leading role in the uh, liberalization process uh, when adopted the regulation 1008. We still are leading. There are some countries in the United States which surprisingly, by the way, still 25%, but recently, notwithstanding the protectionist regime that is just uh, around the, the, the United States politi politics right, right now, the, I've read that there's been a recent bill submitted in order to extend to 49% in the United States the regime, as well in Canada, as well in, the, uh, in Mexico. 49% uh, is in other countries as, as Australia, as India. Interesting also to mention that in the domestic market, Australia and India have liberalized. They have re removed the 49% rule of ownership and control for domestic flight. Why? Because there are no air service agreements. 
this is, this is the basic, that they can manage internally and that they are set investments for the domestic market. Of course, airlines that operate in just the domestic market, it depends on the region, is not easy to be found. But this is something interesting. I believe also India has uh, released this kind of rule internally. They can't, external, in an international relationship. So that's the situation for the time being. As been mentioned also, Brazil. Brazil uh, uh, has a very, very uh, tricky situation because actually they decided to release and uh, to remove the barrier uh, and to open the market, to, to open uh, the, the, the capital market to the Brazilian airlines. But actually, uh, the president uh, in 2016, I believe, put a veto. So they came back to the original uh, uh, threshold, that is 20%. But actually, they put forward the initiative. They liberalized for a while. They submitted also to ICAO, and I want to mention something on this subject, and then I will close. Uh, in order to extend this approach um, uh, at, at the international level, actually, some uh, protectionist policy or whatever brought back the, this, this initiative. Interesting that China and Chile, uh, that is one of the most <coughs> developed countries from the aviation in the Latin America, has, has, has removed the barrier. And uh, they, they, they are going very, very well. And by the way, the relaxation of uh, some rules, or rules on ownership and control in Latin America has facilitated the merge of the Latin, that create, uh, creating Latin, that is the company that is going very, very well in, the, in the Latin America. So the issue is, in my opinion, and I don't touch the political aspects of, uh, of protectionism or liberalism, but just to understand if there is a way to support a process that is anyway in place, that is a liberalization, privatization, giving access to foreign capitals in order to support further development and consolidation of airlines without prejudicing the, uh, the, 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 let's say, the economic market internally and the competition in the region. In this sense, the idea to move towards the concept of a principle base of a business is something that some countries are already considering. One big issue, in my opinion, is the regulatory control, rather than the control of the capital, and including that some countries, by the way, I didn't mention, have adopted also, in the rule, they impose also the nationality of the management. Uh, the, to move from the control of the, the ownership control rule to a, a control, a regulatory control, this is fundamental, by the way, not for just for taxation, but also passengers' rights, safety, and so on. I do believe, also, this, although this is not a, actually an easy and fast proposal, that as the <coughs> fundament of the rule was generated in ICAO, in a certain way, in ICAO, where there is the international, international civil aviation catering, the solution should be identified the fund. Actually, something is happening because in uh, ICAO there are some reflections on a multilateral agreement on market access, that could be a base, or and on a convention dedicated ad hoc on the liberalization of the capital in uh, civil aviation. Of course, we are talking about ICAO, convention. We know that the adoption of convention requires a certain number of years to be implemented because there is a ratification process. Anyway, it's interesting to see that uh, in ICAO, let's say, let's put ICAO is not outside ourselves, it's, it's composed by member states. Mm -hmm. the, the idea to use, to come back to ICAO in order to find a way that would bring member states in agreement on rules that would be common and would not create, uh, let's say, jeopardization of one against the other one is interesting. This option is not the immediate option, as I said, it will take time, but it could be interesting because it could anticipate some steps that with the leading, leading role of the European Union, with the support of other regions as the United States, could bring, uh, could remove this kind of uh, rule that again, I wanted to underline, there is not in um, the maritime, there is not in the railway, 
just two weeks ago, the second Italian railway company has been bought by a fund from the United States. It's not part of the rule. The body. Okay, some Italian newspapers raise the hand. Oh, wow, we lost the nationality bond. They bought 2,000 uh, 2, uh, billion, two billion <coughs> euro, not too bad. So these are the rules. I do believe that uh, the issue is to reflect what could be the best way to move forward. For sure, we cannot stay because this is something that is going to penalize a, a mode of transportation against other modes of transportation. But we should also identify the best way that should not unilaterally go too far, penalizing the facto the, the, the European airlines. And something like this, I'm sure that could facilitate also the political reflections if there are evidence of benefits for all the components that in this case uh, the, the, the protectionism but that is not existing in the maritime the domain would not exist any longer in the future for aviation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here in your house, uh, Costas, um, and um, setting the scene for this uh, discussion. I hope you allow me to sit down to stay seated. I have a bit of a back problem, so standing up for longer than five minutes will kill me. And I was standing up because of my back problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's different back problem. <laughs> well, I will try. I will try. Um, I, yesterday, I wrote down some of the aspects I think which are or could be interesting in this uh, in this uh, debate. Um, as had been said uh, uh, by others, the core challenge we face today in the field of ownership and control lies in the fact that in the past, industry and governments were aligned on the strategic, economic and developmental roles of aviation and the traditional way governments cope with these roles. But in the past decades, our industry has moved uh, at an enormous pace in seeking new ways to cooperate, to consolidate, to form alliances and to merge and liberalization and globalization, as well as regional economic unification, like in the EU, have changed aviation and have changed the whole environment. And the economic wishes of the industry in the field of, for instance, foreign investment and multinational ownership are not met by the original criteria as set out in the Chicago Convention more than 70 years ago, like you said. Um, while perhaps understandable from a historical perspective of sovereignty and the traditional links between a great number of nations and their flag carriers, the prevailing rules at the moment, uh, based on national ownership and control, seem outdated uh, for the needs of the modern world of aviation. The Netherlands, my country, has always been on the forefront of uh, liberalization. Um, we were the first states to negotiate an open skies agreement with the US in the beginning of the 90s of the last century and also invested early in bilateral agreements with China and Japan. The KLM is the oldest existing airline carrying its original name, and our hub airport Amsterdam uh, Schiphol, which is more than 100 years old, uh, is the best connected airport in the world. But also the EU is a frontrunner, like Philip Cornelis told you. In 2002, the rulings of the European <coughs> Court of Justice have led to the abolishment of the use of national ownership and control criteria within Europe. In one stroke, the scope of ownership and control was broadened to the whole single market. In the wake of this ruling, the European Commission was quick to develop its external aviation policy and managed to agree upon the so-called EU standard clauses, either through their horizontal mandate to do so, or by successfully negotiating with a number of important countries an entire aviation agreement. Similarly, all EU member states, including my country, have also been able to bilaterally agree upon the EU clauses, relatively easy with most <coughs> uh, countries. Although perhaps still only partly liberalized, as only the last for 49% of ONC by non-EU states or individuals, the standard EU clauses have been accepted by most countries worldwide. They <coughs> prove that amendment of nationality criteria is possible in a relatively short span of time. Other countries and regions at the, in the world have also managed to take a more flexible approach to ONC and in some cases have implemented even more liberal rules in the past years. Uh, examples of Southern America, Chile, Colombia have also been mentioned. All these examples can serve as stepping stones for more ambitious aim of liberalization of ONC regimes 
on the international level, as ICAO is trying with its ATRP panel at the moment. It's currently working on a multilateral convention on foreign investment, and also this has many, in many ways uh, proven to be a very long and, and winding path. We must remain uh, positive, to my opinion, and confident that whatever the outcome is, the ideas and developed clauses can serve as useful templates for other regional or bilateral agreements, which aim for more flexibility in this area. Which way to go from here? We have to move forward, and governments have to listen carefully to what industry tells them um, uh, about their ideas and their needs. Although in these economic uh, better times, industry seems somewhat quiet on the issue of ONC, and maybe uh, the ways to circumvent the whole issue uh, is acceptable in, and, and also uh, accepted in uh, bilateral agreements. But I personally think, and I presume with a lot of you here, that the benefits of liberalization seem clear-cut. But on the, on the other hand, we don't reach the other end of the rainbow if there is no real dialogue between industry and states on the way forward. Because there are potential risks uh, of more liberalization of ONC, which some governments perceive. And governments have a legitimate interest in protecting their national sovereignty, so it has to be debated. One of the lessons from the EU, in my opinion, is that an important precondition for further liberalization uh, is the merge of aviation policies of states concerned. Some states uh, need some sort of safeguard for their perceived uh, risks of further liberalization, and comp compatibility of aviation systems, goals and policies could be such a precondition for allowing more liberalization. And this varies from state to state, depending on specific circumstances. It's different for, uh, for instance, a developing state with a lack of good uh, connectivity, or for instance, a state with a big legacy carrier with a vested ne a network in place, or for a state with a suffering carrier in need of cash. So the way forward for a state has to be consistent with its goals for the aviation policy and their means to achieve, achieve that, like safety, security, labor, uh, oversight, fair competition, connectivity, etc. And there's nothing wrong with reciprocity. Why let another state or block of states get for free what they are not offering to you? The EU has paved the way with the 49% and the more liberalized company structures which are allowed within inside the Union uh, nowadays. And not many big states followed until now. Maybe one of the ways forward to keep moving in the direction of more liberal ONC criteria lies in the area of the establishment criteria, in the principal place of business or in the principle of regulatory nationality. These concepts could maintain the links between the state, or the block of states, and the designated airline. These ways are worth exploring with states and industry. Who exactly owns the airline should not be as important when the interest of the state can be attained in other ways, like establishment criteria or more narrowly defined regulatory nationality. Safeguarding your aviation policy goal as a state is what should be of the state's prime interest. It's about not risking safety and security, good labor policy, good connectivity, fair passenger rights, quality oversight, etc. The fear of some states is that they could end up with flags of convenience, which are registered in a state with the lowest aviation standards operating on their air service agreements. Um, criteria uh, for, uh, for the, the uh, uh, establishment, uh, the establishment criteria could help as an intermediate period to facilitate acceptance of more liberalized regimes of ownership and control by other states with which we have bilateral agreements. They can safeguard national interests of the states, while on the other hand gaining the benefits for industry. And in the end, of course, it's as successful as it is accepted by other states in the air service agreements. To recopulate, there's much to say in favor of the move to more liberalization of the current ONC provisions. And each state or block of states, like the EU, has to find its balance in line with its aviation policy. But I'm convinced there are roads forwards which needs to be discussed starting today. Uh, and maybe not with a big bang industry sometimes once, but maybe slowly forward with the next intermediate period. And we're looking forward to seeing uh, the proposals from the Commission later this year. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much for these uh, uh, very insightful uh, introductory notes.
My understanding is that uh, all our speakers are in general comfortable with uh, the idea of uh, uh, further relaxation of uh, ownership and uh, uh, control provided of course that uh, we meet certain criteria for example to avoid flags of uh, convenience to avoid what we call a uh, race to the bottom making sure that uh, social and environmental uh, sustainability is uh, top on the agenda uh, so the first question I would like to ask to all three of you is uh, about uh, regulatory harmonization and uh, Salvatore did mention the important role that ICAO may play and if we look for example at the uh, EU ETS, the emissions trading scheme introduced by the EU in the very beginning it was uh, uh, I would say uh, very ambitious and then a number of uh, countries outside the EU started blaming the EU for introducing extraterritoriality from the back door and as you know eventually we saw a chaos jumping into the scene introducing course here but then course is not uh, I would say as comprehensive and as ambitious as uh, the UETS and it's uh, it may take time and so for the time being we have a stop the clock uh, process within the EU we're waiting for ICAO to fully implement course here so the big question here is okay ICAO is the ideal forum but uh, is it too slow uh, would it be better, for example, to introduce uh, uh, GATS, uh, the General Agreement on Trading Services, which until now does not include aviation, or do you think we should move forward only with uh, ICAO? Shall we start with you, uh, Senator? Well, I, I raised the issue of ICAO, uh, but I, I was clear. As I would say, the origin of the uh, service agreements with the provisions for uh, uh, ownership and control were right in ICAO more than 70 years ago. ICAO should consider that something changed in 70 years and should move forward in order to create conditions more compatible with the same. I wouldn't say better, not better. Compatible with the new scenario uh, in the world. That is a globalization of the market, of the air transport market, and of the movement of capitals. And so, so I do believe that this is a fundamental component. I don't want to say that this is the only way. The, 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 what, you, what you mentioned on ETS Corsia is very useful <coughs> because it's not the first time that the European Union, Europe, go a little bit forward, maybe, <coughs> in this way push international uh, uh, community to go in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. This happened with ETS. We know that ETS has been uh, not successful as such, but has been successful because we have been uh, able to bring in ICAO an agreement that is covering all your ICAO member states. So it's a good step forward, although it's not exactly ambitious as it was ETS. Now, on uh, the specific issue, I do believe that this is a way that ICAO has to follow and there is actually a progress internally uh, in order to propose a convention. When I say convention, you can of course be terrified because a convention in ICAO means uh, ages, uh, time uh, for, for adoption and the ratification is huge. Anyway, that does mean that we will not help because it's, a, it's a, it, let's say it's a, an indication, it's an objective, it's a way to, to, to ensure that we have to move in a certain direction and this could facilitate regional agreements, or could facilitate the renegotiations because let's remind one of the key issues is that if uh, air service agreements with all parties are in agreement that these rules can be modified. But of course, it's not easy with, uh, let's say, with the status quo rules. Could be easier if there is a perspective offered by ICAO. In conclusion, ICAO is not the solution as such, but uh, unless in the long term, but it's a good uh, step forward in order to support a progress and uh, an and, uh, and evolution of the system in uh, terms of regional uh, and multilateral agreements. Thank you. Other? I have a question. Please, please. Uh, because I, I, I'm Abdurrahman Faha from the Arab Air Carriers Organization. I keep on hearing the word uh, flags of convenience as if it is the taboo for doing nothing. Now, my problem is I don't really understand 
what's the difference between flags of convenience in aviation and flags of convenience in telecom or in banking? Because it's an industry, it's a business. And once that business is addressing <coughs> what the customer wants, either the customer will uh, actually reward that business or the customer will punish it. Now, I was always on a side note. I was always against this blacklist of countries and airlines outside the European Union, as if it's fair for Africans to die, but it's not fair for Europeans to die on those. Uh, now, the customers punish the airlines who are not performing well. So, again, I mean, here I'm, I'm lost. There are, of course, in this day and age, actually it was always the case, you have the politics of hope, and you have the politics of fear. Now, the, what happens is that between politics of hope, politics of fear, you get the status quo. And everybody defends the status quo because they are not even bold enough to go for hope, or there are so much, there are so much fears that will prevent them from doing this. Honestly, the way I look at Europe and coming from the Arab world, which is suffering from, from actually being in, in, in a situation which is, I would say, 200 years behind the European geopolitical situation. When I look at Europe, I look at a revolution that happened in the 50s, when they said, OK, no more wars. Let's get together. And that was hope, all right? Because if you left it to the fear, we would have been, probably, you would have gone through two other world wars. Probably you wouldn't have been speaking. Anyhow, because we would have been annihilated. So you have these bold people who would push the envelope and create a revolution. Now, of course, with every revolution, you would have some hiccups. Trump, Brexit, Dutch politician, I don't know what's his name. <laughs> Unless you meant Rutte, I don't know. <laughs> so you have that, but these are hiccups. And let's not, not try to think of the current, because we always talk on the basis of the past. Look at what's happening in the US today, all right? A country which actually idolizes arms. Look at what's happening. The millennials. Are, are, I was shocked, I was pleasantly shocked, when I started hearing those millennials talking that they are so clear, so, so uh, home guard and thinking and so on. We're not thinking, now talking about the politics of the present, we're not thinking of the millennials. Millennials, they don't care about geography, they don't know it even. They don't care about where you come from, they don't care about what, what religion, what nationality you belong to, what we try to do is to try to impose on that generation the politics of the past or the culture of the past. So with all due respect to all the fears, our role as leaders is to push the envelope, not to try to be hostages to what is happening today. In my opinion, and I will say it later when I will sit on the panel, let it be free for all, uh, yeah, save safety oversight, uh, consumer rights, and some governance issue that the government would need to put its, its finger on because this is why it was elected. But let the business work and see the result. See the result. So politics of fear will not leave anywhere. I think the only way we can go forward is with hope. Uh, I'll try to have some hope, but let, uh, let's, start, uh, <laughs> let's start a bit on the, uh, before brackets, a little bit on the skeptical mode and making a few comparisons. Uh, in Oba, you, you always need to have a certain window of opportunity, because uh, some of the policies, I mean, uh, let's take a maybe very inappropriate example, but I'll take the common agriculture policy, referring to what you have said uh, in your introduction. Uh, uh, not on agriculture, but uh, on the aviation sector and on, on transport as such. I mean, there was, uh, there was a set of objective reasons why to set up the agriculture policies we have set it up. I mean, we are 70 years, nearly uh, 60 years uh, 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 down the road, so to say. And of course, 
Many of us would like to reform the common agricultural policy, but it's basically impossible. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it, it's there, and if you feel the flavor, if it tastes good, uh, you love it. Yeah, uh, and, and you create an enormously strong lobby. Now, another example was railways. Uh, there is one difference, and you have basically referred to it, and then maybe you will correct me that I'm wrong, but uh, I'm not a transport expert, but uh, uh, I mean, uh, the difference is uh, that uh, in aviation, the environment today is, uh, as you just referred to, uh, for many, you know, uh, has the perception of European versus uh, uh, Middle East, eventually Chinese. In railway, you don't have that. I mean, uh, it's marginal. Uh, and the fact is that, of course, I mean, uh, we still manage if, if a French company buys Italian, vice versa, uh, whatever. I mean, it's still sensitive, but if it is uh, uh, soundproof on, on, on safety, uh, consumer protection, passengers' rights, environmentally friendly, and so on, then it's fine. Yeah? Now, <coughs> coming back, uh, let's say, to, uh, to the future, so to say. Uh, of course, uh, um, I mean, uh, and also to the question of ICAO. I think that at the moment for me, uh, um, the, the issue where is slightly secondary because we really need to go through uh, what uh, Mr. Cornelis referred to and see I know, wh wh whether we've got a convincing case to, to move. Yeah? If we've got a convincing case to move, in a, still in a very difficult environment, it can happen. But it's, it's not easy, because again, you have referred to telecom, for example. Yeah, but telecom was, again, European industry. And, uh, and it was at a time uh, you know, where you would have a certain leadership. Energy, the same, European industry. But there was a clear need uh, in terms of unbundling, because uh, you would have a sound case for the consumer, and you would also have energy companies which were in, in real difficulty, and you had a good mix of policy making, on one hand, regulatory environment and competition policy, I mean, the relevant commission putting pressure and the industry unbundled, yeah? I mean, uh, for, for the benefit uh, as such and for the consumer. Now, in aviation, I agree that uh, the Netherlands are uh, uh, up front in, in liberal, uh, let's say, in, in liberalism, so to say, but it's also Air France KLM, which is one of the, uh, uh, let's say, biggest lobbyists uh, on 868. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, and they are the ones that uh, they will be co-setting the scene. Uh, so I think we've got a, a balloon, a, a testing balloon. So to the point where to do it and, uh, and how to do it. There are a few things that can, ha can help. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you know, even at the 868, in fact, uh, can, can help if we have a good mixture of uh, a good revision uh, plus uh, bilateral agreements which come on time with good content and where the counterparts uh, show attitude which is building confidence. And that differs. I mean, we've got positive uh, examples and we've got negative examples. Thinking of I don't know what, but I mean, the bilateral agreements are absolutely a must, including the competition uh, clause. It, it, can, it can help. Yeah. Uh, and the fact is that a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the countries of origin of some of the airliners are not being entirely constructive. While the bilateral agreements, if I were them, I would, uh, I, I would go, I would uh, move fast, uh, and I would like to be among, among the upfront uh, up, uh, runners. Because if you take even the sensitive industries, like tobacco, for example, uh, you will Say, uh, see people in the commission that will say BAT, like, but Philip Morris, that was a, this is the same product, but it's the attitude, yeah, and the, it's the, the constructive collaborative approach. That is something that, that can help. And of course, on our side, yes, I mean, we have already referred to it. Uh, I, I would be very much in favor, but we need to analyze it. We need to have a condensing case. If we say that it helps consolidation, how it helps consolidation, if it uh, helps access to capital, how it helps. So, I mean, the, we need to build up the story. Yeah? Uh, and we need to have opportun opportunity and we need to have a leadership. And that's not easy. I mean, I say that because I really have a problem with the current uh, politics, not just in Europe. They are in crisis. You lack uh, leadership. You, you lack the ability to, to decide, uh, to have a certain vision, uh, etc. Uh, so yes, uh, let's go for it with certain safeguards on a multilateral forum uh, as well. Uh, you have ma mentioned the ETS, uh, but the ETS is something that uh, uh, you know, you've got a solid engine force inside you to say, e let's go, let's be the leaders, even if the, the rest don't, uh, don't follow. Because it's, 
it seemed beneficial and because green is now, uh, you know, if you don't speak green, you are not in, if I were to simplify. So you need to create a situation that, uh, exactly. <laughs> that, uh, that if, if, uh, if uh, you need to create a story for a relaxation as in a way that if you would not speak about it, you are, you are not in. And then it is, I would say, uh, secondary work exactly, but I would say ICAO is, is, is a place. Mm -hmm. And if you probe this uh, uh, on the ICAO field, uh, and I think that we've got a solid uh, homework done, uh, done on our side, uh, with an opportunity, with a certain leadership, clear case, things can move, uh, uh, and I think we can be upfront with uh, dragging the, the, the rest of the world uh, behind us. But it's, it's like a mosaic in which you need to fit uh, the bits and pieces, and some of the bits and pieces have to come from uh, also well, part now, of the world. Oh, please let me speak. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you, the, your, your last example is a beautiful example of hope. I mean, I was talking. I philosophy. told you I was talking <laughs> about hope. I was talking philosophy there first, but now let's talk real mm -hmm. things. You said, you know, the ETS. What did the ETS do? Actually, it puts the target or, or it carried the torch, all right, for what is good for the whole group and put it forward. And the whole world had to scramble somehow to come to terms with. You know, we can't, you know, let Europe be the first one. Let's try to get all together in order to find a way so that we can do it all together. And this is what you did. You actually created, uh, uh, the, uh, you got the high moral grounds and you forced the rest of the world because of the ETS. I don't, you know, I didn't like the ETS because it was done unilaterally, but I like the ETS because it was done unilaterally. Because if you waited for the whole world, you're becoming world to do philosophical it. now. Even. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, if you waited for the whole world, and actually, I think you tried their best, and they could not agree on anything. And the industry, by the way, which I represent, uh, you know, part of it, uh, the industry kept saying that no, 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 don't regulate us, leave us alone, and we are very good uh, social citizens, and so on. You don't put any targets for us. You did it in a way which, okay, we will do it if the IRS is not going to do it. Now we will have fights, we will have disputes, so let's try to agree on something global. Now I come to the 868. 868 represents, it's the manifestation of fear. If I look at IAG, which is the most successful group of airlines in Europe, they're not fearful. They're very bold and they are against, you know, the protectionism. 868, I see it as an antithesis of what the EU is. And you're telling me I'm waiting for you. And I, let me tell you, with Henrik and I were the actual engineers, and, and you know, I give him credit, and I take some of it, the credit, of course, the engineers of the dialogue, and I went around and convinced politicians in my part of the world to go forward with the dialogue because I thought, you know, Keeping talking from two sides of the Mediterranean and attacking each other is not going to work. And, and this is where you need to be bold. I know Lufthansa, I know Austria, I know uh, Air France uh, is pushing forward for, to protect uh, you know, their, their, yeah, their jobs. They have some rights, of course. But I also know that if you don't push the boundary and make it, uh, you know, easy for the airlines to operate, for the customers to decide, I know that you are protecting the status quo. And this is not how you reach ownership and control liberalization. This is how you maintain the current status quo by camouflaging it, by saying, oh, we need to protect European jobs. We need to protect European. What happened in the, in the IT and the telecoms industry when it was liberalized? Mostly European companies won, won the scene. Vodafone, Orange, and so on. Now they are the global players. If you open it, don't be afraid, and this is what we are saying. You are talking to the wrong person, but I have to react on that. No, no, I mean, I mean, you are the voice of the people, so I'm talking to you. <laughs> I'm going to come home and I'll say, you know, shut up, I'm your voice. <laughs> okay, Rob, can, can I just one sentence on this? Please say, you know, I, I mean, I would agree with you just partly. I mean, the fact is that there is a certain environment, a certain mood, and you have to deal with it. I mean, you have, you've got a number of ways to deal with it. Either you have a status quo, 
which is anyway an environment of, I don't know whether fear, of concern, and you let it be, and you're going to be among the first victims of that, because they will find a way, believe me. Or you come with a, a two-pillar system of revision of 868 and bilateral agreements, I mean, with a solid content, which, you know, is meeting the main objective, prevention, and establishing a certain comfort and certain confidence. And believe me, if you are on time with the bilateral agreements, uh, with a solid content, uh, you've got the main platform there. And we, of course, need to make sure the, the revision of ATX8 is solid content. I must say that uh, with a solid outcome, I think very little will be happening. And, it's, uh, and the Commission, in this respect, as critical as it might be on a number of issues, came with the right approach. It based itself on well-tested legislation with trade defense instruments. If we keep it there, don't worry, you're going to get the environment of hope. Rob. <laughs> well, I really hard time. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's preferable, of course, to, to negotiate on a, on a global level. But there is, there is um, uh, a much, much to say against uh, state aid. There is uh, much to say against not moving on the environment. So then it's second best to do it at regional level. And I think what the ETS proved is, is that it, uh, it, it was an important uh, uh, message to, to ICAO to, to move. Um, and in that sense, it has been, uh, it has been successful. Um, but of course, uh, extraterritorial uh, policies uh, is not preferable, of course not. Uh, but sometimes uh, politicians can't wait to, uh, to move. And that's, that's the same with your, your plea for liberalization. Of course, countries are in different uh, uh, most uh, stages of development, that's one. And the second one is that you have to cope and to convince the, the, the people. Uh, and and I, I completely uh, agree with, uh, with Pavel. I I'm, I'm think the Netherlands is one of the most liberal countries in, in Europe. But even in this time, it's, it's very complicated to convince the public that progress is good, that's always, that progress is always good, and that liberalization is always good. And we have to cope with that, and that's that's very that's very difficult sometimes. And uh, yes. and uh, and saying that uh, well, you have to you have to gamble, and uh, and it, it helped you in the past, uh, is, isn't always the right message. Uh, that, that, that's 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 what I see. That uh, check really among the most liberal. I mean, we are the fifth most open economy in the world, yeah. but still we encounter which we have just referred to. Yeah. So well, that's much more difficult. You have a question. Please. I, I just have a comment. It's not a question. Mm -hmm. you know, let's look at Switzerland. Uh -huh. Okay, we have a good agreement with the European uh, Union, but uh, in fact, we don't have any airline. And if we would look at ownership and control <coughs> about Swiss airline, you know, mm -hmm. the control and the ownership is fully German. Uh, and Frankly, Swiss airline is very popular and very successful in Switzerland. So when you said what counts for an airline is, is it serving the market? Is it serving the market well? And when it's true, it works. And there's nobody in Switzerland, except a few cases, <coughs> decisions are not taken in Zurich, they are taken probably in Frankfurt. And since then, the and quality went down a bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if you look at the management, the management is fully German. Mm -hmm. And what is, what is funny is that another airline, another Swiss, we don't have too many airlines in Switzerland, another airline was bought by a golf carrier. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the, the, the regulators in Switzerland start talking about ownership and control. All of a sudden, they, it was a big problem. For example, they wanted to, this airline wanted to operate a line between Geneva and Zurich. And it took about uh, yeah, six months for the regulators to accept that with a lot of constraint because of ownership and control. So that's a little bit, uh, you know. Hi, Jean Jacques Dias with Tapia uh, Portugal, uh, small, medium-sized carrier from a small country in Europe. Um, 
Well, let me say, um, and thank you, Salvatore, for uh, <coughs> underlining uh, the, the, the historical role uh, behind uh, uh, where we are now, because that's very important uh, to understand uh, which is the more uh, effective path to follow. Um, I would say that the incentive to move forward is there. Um, and it's twofold. Uh, one, airlines, as capital intensive uh, as they are, need a diversity of financing sources yes. as much as they can. That's advantages for airlines, uh, such as ours. Uh, the state is not going to fund anything, uh, any development, and uh, we need uh, a renewal of fleets, uh, and all that comes for the benefit of, uh, of the consumers, for, for, for the benefit of uh, the traveling uh, public. Uh, in fact, I think that it was more than 10 years ago uh, that IATA um, reflected upon uh, the liberalization of air transport uh, in an exercise called Agenda for Freedom. And uh, we were very much involved in that. Uh, we thought that there might be an option of like-minded <coughs> countries building concentric circles around this idea. We, uh, we actually uh, draw from, uh, uh, from a shelf uh, the Malliot uh, concept of a multilateral agreement uh, for the liberalization of air transport, international air transport. And uh, we thought that, that the concept could be built uh, on a phased-in, customized, tailored way among uh, like-minded states. Because uh, what we do not want to have is havoc. Uh, there must be reciprocity. You were just talking about Darwin. But yeah. there's no reciprocity there. Yeah. Because if you want to buy 1% of Emirates, you cannot. It's so expensive, but... Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, there's, <laughs> that's a question of time. There's zero, there's zero, <laughs> zero <laughs> the So uh, what I'm saying is, you know, there, is, there are criteria, such as, of course, uh, uh, regulatory um, oversight uh, 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 and regulatory convergence, which comes with that, uh, reciprocity, and so on. But this criteria could be put together around the concept uh, of, uh, you know, concentric circles, where a, f a few like-minded countries would start full liberalization, and then others could adhere later uh, when they are ready, uh, as they feel comfortable. You know, I think this is the path. Uh, I'm not sure about I going back to ICAO, because we can see at the conferences and assemblies how difficult it is to uh, come to a convergence, a consensus building in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, international uh, uh, liberalization of air transport. But if, if, if there is the will, and if, the, uh, if the, the stimulus is there, the incentive is there, it's all for the better of the environment uh, in which we do business, all for the better of the customers that use our services. If there's a will, from like-minded countries to get together and start this movement, then it will come, slowly evolve, and it will come in a comfortable, tailored way. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take another question, and then we can go on to our panelists. Hello, my name is Antonio Sinidalas. I am uh, happy to see so many esteemed colleagues in this room, and I congratulate Costas for the initiative. Uh, I wish to add another dimension to everything that you have said so far. From my uh, small experience of 35 plus years in air transport, having uh, started up two airlines, changed regulations in some European countries, being a president of the European Regional Airlines for six years, and uh, also advisor to the Commission during the, uh, uh, the time of Mr. Kalas. Uh, I wish to remind all of us that uh, air transport is just about the most cross-border operation that exists in our societies today. I leave uh, telecommunications on the side because it's largely mechanical, whereas air transport is human-based and uh, it is a day-to-day -day operation that affects millions of people as we know. <coughs> I consider it is my opinion, of course, and uh, I'm happy to hear that uh, most opinions, especially from the representatives of the regulators and the, and the people, 
uh, from the Euro Parliament converge to that, we are approaching fast a time that we have to make some very radical and very important decisions in Europe at first and see how we can affect the rest of the world later. The question of ownership of airlines is one of them as it comprises uh, one of the aspects that allows or doesn't allow seamless uh, exchange of ideas, capital, knowledge, knowledge uh, diffusion of everything that uh, air transport is about being, as we said, the most cross-border operation that humans have. Now, Europe has been very prolific and very creative and very pioneering since it managed, as uh, my good friend Abdul said very correctly, to decide that we need peaceful ways of uh, discussing and creating the way forward since the 50s and has uh, found, and I have been a witness to many of that, starting for instance with the 2005 effort to unite the European skies, which is still ongoing and that's the danger, uh, to put together a few standards which affect instead of each individual country of the many in the European Union and also the European Civil Aviation Conference by their agreement in all aspects of air transport. This from my view as industry representative, has uh, allowed for significant economy, significant efficiencies to be improved, to be brought into the system. As this expanded geographically and uh, population-wise was even further exacerbated. The problem that we have now is that we as Europe need to take uh, some bold steps in that most cross-border operation of ours, air transport, uh, using it, in my opinion, in a far more important aspect, a political aspect, uh, as an indicator, actually a key performance indicator of the way forward in all other activities of our society. In other words, if we cannot succeed in air transport, I don't think we can succeed in anything else. And I take the example of the European Seamless European Skies uh, experiment, which I was present when Mr. Barrow announced it in 2005 in Paris, but we are now in 2018, and we all know that the single European sky experiment, in spite of all good intentions and all good efforts by many good people, has been more or less halted. That creates a level of inefficiency in the entire system within Europe, let alone outside of Europe, where we have a multitude of other opinions, ideas, and political positions. So, representing the air transport position, the industry position, the airlines would definitely, if I was still the president of the ERA, which I'm not, but uh, my other good friends are, and they are, uh, they've succeeded in very good ways in promoting the interests of the industry, uh, I would definitely insist on expanding freedom in all that, but also in applying that freedom within Europe as we have already started to do many years ago, and we have not yet concluded that. If we do not continue to conclude that, and if we do not succeed in convincing ourselves, the public, the politicians, as you said very correctly in your last statement that the public opinion in the Netherlands is, for instance, divided, is sometimes <coughs> hostile to such ideas. Well, we must always remind them what the, alter the alternative is and what the danger is, not just for air transport, but for the entire uh, socio-political development of Europe. And if Europe, which is, in my opinion, the most advanced human experiment of unifying diverse, diverse uh, populations into a single working and free society. If we cannot actually succeed in Europe in that, then what we can expect for the rest of the world? Talking about bilateral agreements or anything else. That was my, my point, and I wish to congratulate Costas for introducing this idea of this uh, gathering today. I'm very happy to see such a high level of representation, because I think that air transport being far more than just communication and transportation is very a very important indicator that if regulators and decision makers realize as such, they will definitely consider the most important moves they have to make without hesitation in the future. Can I ask a question to the panel? Um, we are sometimes portrayed in Europe as, as being protectionist, but I think when it comes to ownership control, we are the only major aviation player who is actually offering liberalization to our partners and, and, and one of the very few is considering future liberalization. So my question to you is why is there such a resistance to, or why is it such a sticky uh, concept, uh, these ownership and control uh, rules around the world, not just in Europe? Is it, is it because of the original uh, concern of national security, uh, which, uh, which seems to gain again some uh, traction when you see what Mr. Trump announced on steel and aluminium? Is it because uh, the, the incumbent airlines uh, 
feel protected by uh, ownership and control yeah. rules? Is, is that the main yes. driver, or is it jobs? Yeah. Or is it the, the the fair competition, level playing field, uh, flags of convenience <coughs> concern that uh, that that may exist? I, I wanted to ask the panel. Let's uh, say, generally speaking, not just in Europe, what are the the obstacles to uh, to thinking more creatively about ownership and control? <coughs> Where the hell are we that the commission is asking the European Parliament questions? <laughs> <laughs> it has to be the other way around. I mean, it's a re reverse uh, order of democracy. That's why it's such a unique forum. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he told you it's the first time that Henry actually uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the commission is in a mess. I mean, the, uh, the uh, I don't know. I, to be honest, uh, I, it's just a few days ago. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure I'm the right person, uh, lacking the expertise, uh, the experience, but also coming from a country where, in fact, talking about, uh, at, uh, you know, the Czech airlines were owned, uh, I don't know, 30 plus percent by South Koreans, uh, at, uh, and then uh, graduate by out, and uh, as of uh, last week, uh, Czech airlines are owned 100% uh, by a Czech private company. Yeah, with a, with a co by a competing airliner, so the, the state out of it, uh, uh, South, uh, South Koreans are out of it. Uh, so I mean, it it, it can happen. Uh, so I'm not sure that I'm c coming from the from the right environment, but I think that uh, you have basically said it all. But from a, I can't speak from uh, the perspective of uh, I don't know uh, uh, Southeastern uh, uh, Asian Airlines, Middle East. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have that uh, that knowledge. But if I were uh, looking at it uh, from a uh, European point of view, then I think that uh, among all those legitimate uh, points that you have raised uh, or mentioned, I would say the uh, the social, the 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 jobs, the employment, etc., uh, the the standards. This is this is the key, especially in line. And I, I coming back to the previous uh, uh, gentleman uh, that. Uh, um, a question. I'm sorry, I don't uh, remember the name. Thank you. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the fact is that uh, uh, we all that is true that has been said, but then you need to have someone uh, that will, as I said and you have said, tell the story and will have the courage, uh, the political courage, to go against the tide. So I think a combination of these. But I, I think that all that you have said from my uh, uh, perspective is correct. But. Uh, the, let's call it the social part of it, uh, probably is, at least in Europe, uh, the driving one. Mm. I don't have the answer. I, I would say that there are, there are two issues that we have to consider. The first one is that uh, international aviation is a global phenomenon, and uh, the major decisions that can uh, put forward the, the development of uh, transportation internationally must be taken or should be taken globally in agreement. And this is just de facto a, 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 a barrier because you need to find a, a way where decisions should be agreed by different parties. The second component is a lack of confidence mm. uh, for several reasons. Between, uh, because you have to consider that uh, even if uh, between two regions, not two countries, two regions, there could be an agreement, you can affect the rest of the world. So there is a need really to have a, a common approach and a final common decision. Then there is a lack of confidence in some regions, we perfectly know, because there is, from one side, the uh, level playing field that is not always the same. We know that these issues are on the ground, and we are not forgetters. So the issue is that uh, the decision, by definition, by the way, aviation, notwithstanding, notwithstanding it's the first way the fastest way to communicate to transport people is the, low, the, the, low, the uh, slowest way to take decisions. The innovation in aviation is really slow. That's a matter of fact. So the only way is to take stock that this is the situation and to work all together, as has been done in several fields, in order to create the environment, to create the, 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 the conditions for agreement at international level. Of course, initiatives at the bilateral level could be helpful if this will prevent, let's say, um, prevent distortion <coughs> uh, or con side consequences that are, were not foreseen. But this could be just one of the options. In my opinion, the only way is to go towards a global decision that will be very, very slow, but there is no way to go in this direction. 
Thank you. Rob? Yeah, I think in the eyes of politicians there are a lot of risks, um, and, and most of them don't like risks, um, at the moment at least. And well, when you when you Pavel can read can react later. And when you look at the um, at the interviews I, I read, you see the the potential risks of, for instance, the deterioration of safety and security standards, less stable operations, impacts on labor, uh, concentration of power, market domination in a strategic market, with in the end negative effects on connectivity, um, the assurance of services in times of crisis. Um, the idea they're only for the money and they leave, uh, uh, they can leave any moment, they're leaving us with the, with the, uh, with the, the bits and pieces. Uh, impacts on national emergency and security uh, requirements and assurance of services in times of crisis, unfair competition. Well, I think all these kinds of things uh, make it unpredictable uh, and, uh, and uh, have an influence. On, uh, on, 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 on favoring liberalization or taking a secure way. Uh, that's what I think. Thank you. Well, what about starting with WTO rules? So as I mentioned before, we, GATS is already there, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. Aviation is not part of it, huh? and it's very much related to the whole protectionism agenda we've discussed. So instead of reinventing the wheel, would it make sense to start with this step, making uh, aviation becoming part of gas and be run by WTO rules? What do you think? Well, it depends which WTO you have in mind, whether the one in Geneva or the one in Madrid. Uh, I think the one in Madrid might be easier with tourism. Not the UNWTO, but I'm referring to the... I know why, I yeah. know why. That was a silly way of uh, trying to uh, make a joke. Uh, well, honestly, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I agree with the uh, professor has said, uh, even though uh, I'm fine with, uh, you know, uh, an avant-garde uh, being played by, uh, by Europe on the base of the elements that uh, we have mentioned at the, at the beginning. But I just, in the current environment, I just don't see that happen. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would say the same. Actually, all, uh, let's say, innovation and uh, the big role of, uh, of, uh, of the airport has been characterized by a single community mm -hmm. within ICAO. Mm -hmm. And for the alliance, the association of the airport is not an association, it's an international, it's an international organization leading the process. Uh, considering all sorts of different components that are, for example, we know perfectly what has an environment, where environment is fundamental, but also the development of the <coughs> has been taken more, let's say, uh, carefully in attention by a care. I don't feel that this uh, option could be followed by, by many member states because they feel more comfortable in a context of this typically where the decision to be taken out. I, I, I tend to agree, but I think there are definitions which are well thought out, for instance, on fair competition in, in these, uh, in, in these uh, areas, uh, which can be used, for instance, in bilateral agreements of the Union with other countries. Um, so there has been a lot of thinking on, on certain economic aspects which are well thought out for others, other uh, sectors of the economy. So why not use them in another framework? Uh, because in the end, uh, everybody uh, already agreed on them for the telecom markets, etc. So why not for aviation? Mm. Let's use them. Mm. Uh, on this particular point, I think there are two major obstacles in the WTO structure that prevents you know, expanding it into aviation. Number one, the issue of, uh, of dumping. How do we define dumping? Because if you take dumping definition as per today's WTO, it means all the six freedom traffic has to stop. And this is, I mean, uh, nobody can live without six freedom traffic. No one country in the world, probably Chile can, because they are at the end, I mean, nobody wants to go to Antarctica. But, and, and uh, the second one is dispute resolution. Now, this is what, what can actually ICAO take from the WTO is dispute resolution. Up till now, what we are stuck with is two governments negotiating. Each one is trying to pull the rug to its constituents. There is no uh, like ombudsman or uh, an arbitration process 
like in WTO, one can say that, no, this country is at fault, or that player is at fault, and that player is not at fault. So if ICAO can develop uh, an idea of, mm -hmm. of uh, a third party arbitrator for uh, government's disputes, I think, I think that can be a very good step forward to try to at least ease the fears of, uh, of you know, giving, giving up sovereignty over aviation. I think two, two good points, I think uh, definitions and dispute settlement that uh, yeah. one, one could uh, under certain circumstances reflect. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Any other questions? Excellent. So I think it's time for coffee. I would like mm -hmm. to thank all our three panelists and uh, looking forward to the next session. Thank you. 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 Thank you.